everyone, I'm WFM Alexandra and I'm back with more highlights of the Women's Speed Chess Championship. In the finals, we saw Grandmaster Elena Danielian defeat Grandmaster Valentina Gunina in a very close match 15 to 13. Today I bring to you guys some of my favorite games and hopefully you guys can learn a little something from them. Let's get started. In the first game, we have Grandmaster Danielian as white and Grandmaster Gunina as black. Started with d4, d5, knight f3, knight f6, c4, e6, knight c3, a6. Very typical queen's gambit decline moves here. Danielian decided to take on d5, which opens up black's bishop on c8. She continued with bishop g5. Often in these types of lines, you see the bishop on g5. You want to try to get the pin as fast as possible. Black played bishop e6, e3, bishop e7, bishop d3, h6, bishop h4, knight bd7. And here, uh, Grandmaster Daniele and Castle, what she could have considered instead is playing h3. The idea behind this being that it's going to provide a safe haven for the bishop later on in case it gets pushed from the h4 square and she wants to keep the bishop pair. She castled and here Gunina played a very aggressive move that is very common to rapid or blitz style chess. Maybe this wouldn't work in a classical game, but boom, g5 is how she continued here. Often you don't see moves like this because it does weaken the king side and it is tricky to castle on the queen side here because of the open c file. However, she went for it and we'll see whether it paid off or not. Danielian continued with bishop g3, her only option. Gunina played knight h5, putting pressure on the bishop. There's no way for white to stop the exchange from happening. Danielian played knight e5, which I think is a mistake because she ended up doubling two of her pawns. What she should have tried instead is playing bishop e5. f6 isn't an option here to just kick the bishop back because of bishop g6 check, attacking the king and winning the knight next move. If black would have taken the bishop, then at least she has the option of taking with the knight, and now she didn't mess up her pawn structure, and black did, so she has some compensation for the bishops being traded off. Instead, she played knight e5. Black continued with knight takes h3, h takes g3, knight takes e5, d takes e5, and all of a sudden she has two doubled pawns when she could have just had one. You know, I, I think we could do the math there, not as good. Now, you can try to pause this posi position and try to think, how would you continue here as black? You can actually pause the YouTube video and think about it if you want to put in the work. If you just want to relax, then I'll just tell you the answer. Black continued with queen d7, preparing to castle queenside and start her attack after. She wasn't in a rush to play h5 because white doesn't have any counterplay, so she actually does have time to castle her king. Yes, white has a weak pawn on e5, but it didn't make sense to try and attack it yet because the king is the much bigger weakness in this position. White continued with queen c2. This is a normal developing move you often see as you want to connect the two rooks together. On top of that, it's putting pressure on the c-file. So it's a very logical move, um, but unfortunately, it, it wasn't enough to be able to get a real attack. Black castled queenside, and here she played knight e2. Again, she's looking at potentially rerouting her knight to d4 or putting pressure on the c7 square. But I think this idea was too slow because black's attack with pushing the pawn on h5 is just too quick. I think she should have tried something like f4 earlier on to try to block up the position because the longer she waits, um, making moves like knight e2 isn't actually going to help. She played knight e2, king b8, rook ac1, and black was able to push c5 here again. Um, a thing to keep in mind is this is a move that black is able to do only because white has such a bad pawn structure. Had she not taken on e5, the pawn would have been on d4 and this wouldn't have been possible. So black is really taking advantage of 
moves that looked like only a small mistake, but grandmasters have a, an expertise in taking advantage of. Here she played b3 because c4 was a threat. Her bishop would have been trapped, but it's a very passive move. Black played h5, going for the kingside attack. She played f4, trying to come up with some counterplay. She's looking towards f5 to trap Black's bishop. Black plays bishop g4 to get away from the threat. And here, Danielian played queen d2, which is a little confusing to me because I don't think it actually serves a purpose. I think what she should have tried to do is anticipate that h4 was coming and it would open up her kingside and at least try to get rid of one of those pawns and play bishop f5. When you are getting under attack, you want to trade off as many pieces as possible. I'm not saying this position is better for white, but it is better than the queen d2 alternative. Sometimes you have to pick the lesser of two evils. So she played queen d2. Black continued with h4. She played f5. She's still trying to create some counterplay, as we will see. h3 was Gunina's continuation. She is not afraid of any pawn pushes here. She's just marching her way towards the king. Um, she played this pretty quickly. It was a blitz game, so I'm sure she had her sharp tactical intuition, intuition telling her that her attack was stronger than White's here. White continued with f6, putting pressure on the bishop. And you know what Gunina said? She said, hey, you can take my bishop if you want. Don't mind me. I'm just going to gobble more pawns next to your king. H takes g2, attacking the rook and grabbing a pawn. White didn't even have the chance to wait and try to take the bishop on e7. Said White had to play rook f2, moving the rook away from the threat. Uh, I'm guessing she didn't take on g2 right away because of bishop h3 check, which would then lose the rook or lose the exchange. So she was still trying to fight here, rook f2. Black traded on e2, which is something that looks a little unusual because when you have an attack, you're trying to keep the pieces on the board. But what this actually did was make space for the queen to come h to h3, which is a much more potent threat than the bishop being near the king's side. White took on e2, and again, Black's bishop is still hanging here, but white has no chance to take it back. Rook h1, very forcing move. King takes g2, queen h3, king f3, g4, king f4. At this point, you know, as Anna Rudolph said during her commentary on this game, it's not king of the hill. What is that poor king doing on f4? If only it was a different format, maybe it would have had a chance. Um, Gunina continued with queen h6 and... Uh, Danny, Grandmaster Danielian resigned here. I thought this was a really nice game. It shows just how sharp and tactical Miss Gunina was as well, even though she didn't end up winning the match. I thought it was good to illustrate this. And what I like about this game is that it shows how small mistakes in the opening can lead to just a bad middle game and rest of the rest of the story here. The attack that Black had on the king side was really hard to to stop and it's not like Miss Danielian made a, a major mistake after it was just too fast and um, she didn't get an equally scary attack on Black's king. Let's go to the next game. In this next game we once again have Grandmaster Danielian as white and Grandmaster Gunina as black. This time Miss Danielian was the one to get the attack. D4, D5, Knight F3, Knight F6. As we saw in the first game, they do like these queen pawn openings. E3 this time. E6, C4, Bishop E7, Bishop D3, castles, Knight B2, C6, castles, Knight BD7, E4. So unlike the other opening game, she decided not to open up the c8 bishop this time and she tried to go for a line that instead would give her some type of attack of course both lines are sound and it wasn't the style that made the impact on the overall score but this is just to show how she was correcting some of her openings during the actual live event itself black took on e4 and here white took with e4 taking with the bishop would be a mistake you want to keep your bishop pair Knight takes e4, knight takes e4, bishop takes e4. And in a position like that, black always wants to take because now he, she can replace the knight on f6 with her other knight and also make space for the bishop on c8. Here, white played bishop c2. 
h6, trying to not allow any piece to go on g5, but this was actually a mistake. It weakened up black's king side without needing to. If you go back a move, there's actually no real threat from white here. And this is a mistake I commonly see for um, players under 1800. They'll push h6 or h3 or a6 or a3. I think you get the pattern because they're not totally sure what to do and they're afraid of a ghost threat. So something that seems like it could be there, but when you look and actually calculate, there's no real threat. Um, and when we're going to see that h6 actually ended up being uh, a weakness that white successfully took advantage of later in the game. She continued with bishop e3, a normal developing move, b6. Black's bishop on c8 is feeling a little awkward, so she's trying to get it out on b7 as fast as possible. Queen d2. We know where this queen is looking towards. It's looking towards that h6 pawn, looking towards it like a snack. That weakness is about to get taken advantage of. On top of that, like I mentioned in the first game, we like to see the queen moving early on, but more on the second rank or so, just so that we can connect the uh, two rooks in the back so that we can choose if there's an open file at some point where to put them. Bishop b7, she just continued her development. I don't think that she expected any attack on the king side to come so soon. Um, and she continued with rook a d1, bringing her rook to a semi-open file. Queen c7, moving the queen off of the file. And here we see the beautiful bishop takes h6. And at this point, if you're trying to learn and you haven't seen as many of these sacrifices, it's really good to ask yourself what conditions need to be existing in order for a sack on h6 to work. Um, in this position, she isn't actually able to calculate a mate afterwards, especially because there's a knight on f6 and there's a, a quick rook move that's going to give the king space to not get checkmated. But she's able to win two pawns and she has the light squared bishop, the queen, and the knight pointing towards the king. So she has enough peace coordination to make the attack worth it. On top of that, she can imagine the king being stuck in the center after all of the sack with both of her rooks ready to come to the attack. She can think that she'll get at least some compensation for it. Rook fd8 making space for the king. Bishop takes g7. She wanted to grab another pawn for her bishop. She could have just retreated the bishop and be happy with a pawn, but that wouldn't have been living life the correct way. Um, I, I may have gone too far with that analogy, but that wouldn't have been the right variation. So. King takes g7, queen g5, king f8. That king is starting to get cornered, but somehow is still able to stay alive. Queen h6, king e8. The king has so far survived, and it is looking to escape towards d7 and pull off some Houdini mischief that we do not want to allow. So white played knight e5, saying, in your face, you're not getting to d7. I'm sorry, you're staying on the e8 square. I sacrificed my bishop for two pawns. So hopefully I'm going to be able to win this game, as one should think. Here, Gunina found a really resourceful move. She took on d4, and I know that she's tra tra uh, trading a rook for, well, in the case if white would have took um, a minor piece and a pawn, but don't forget that white is already the one who sacrificed first. And in this position, she's getting rid of some of the pieces that were creating serious pressure. Now, bishop f8 is able to defend. Um, as we mentioned before, looking at how many pieces you have surrounding the king for an attack is a really good indicator of whether your attack will be successful. Here, white only has the queen and the rook. The bishop on c2 is no longer do any, doing anything, and the rook on d4 can be easily traded off after black plays something like rook d8 in the future. Danielian, seeing this, even in a blitz game, decided not to take the rook back, and she instead played queen h8, continuing her attack. Bishop f8 was forced, and now she was able to grab the knight. We have to, you know, still take into account the fact that it was a creative plan to take on d4. Um, Gunina would have probably lost the game if she didn't try something creative, so she might as well make the position more difficult for white to solve. Rook takes d1, trading some of the pieces during the attack. Queen e7, trying to trade off the queens. And here, a little bit to my surprise, I thought white was going to keep the queen on the board and try to continue the attack, but she took on e7. 
um, Bishop takes and decided that, hey, I'm up a pawn. That's enough. I can play an endgame. So this was what happened. Bishop e4, bringing her bishop to the center and putting pressure on c6. Uh, as you can see, black is still not able to get the king to d8 because now she has to take care with another threat of c6. When you're in an attacking position, you have to be really careful that you don't let your opponent slowly chip away at your advantage. So she was able to do that by continuing to make threats. Black defended it with rook c8, and now white had to continue the attack. All of her minor pieces and her rook are already doing a great job, so she had to bring the pawn in as well with f4. Um, white continued with rook c, sorry, black continued with rook c7, really just trying to hold the position. Unfortunately, there are not a lot of good moves here for black. She wanted to push c5 to get rid of having to protect the pawn on c6, and now the bishop would not be pinned anymore. White continued with g4. Not only is she looking to attack the king, but potentially she might create a pass pawn on the side. f6, kicking the knight out. Knight f3, bishop a6, b3, b5. Black is trying to create some counterplay here, and she's doing it as fast as she can. But knight d4 is about to win another pawn on c6 or on e6. b takes c4, knight takes e6, rook c8. And tell me, what should white have moved here? If you find it, you are smarter than a grandmaster. Well, I'm just kidding. One move doesn't make anybody smarter or less smart, but uh, you get imaginary internet points. Did you guess bishop g6? That would have been checkmate in one. Instead, she was in some serious time pressure, and she played b takes c4, king f7, and white flagged here. That means she lost on time. wasn't the ending we were expecting. It was still a beautiful game. Had she carried out this beautiful maiden one, that whole bishop takes h6 attack would have been worth it. Oof. Let's move on to the next game. In this last position, we have Grandmaster Daniel Yan as white and Grandmaster Gunina as black. As you can see, white is up a pawn. It's still a pretty tricky endgame to win, and I would encourage you guys to try and play it out against a computer. It's a really good way to practice winning endgames if you don't have someone you could spar with. What you should try to do is figure out what needs to happen in order for you to win. Being just up a pawn isn't enough in certain circumstances. For example, imagine that all of the pawns get traded off except for white's extra pawn. With just one pawn versus a rook and a bishop, black still has really good drawing chances. Black's king is also pretty well defended, so it's not easy to create any checkmate chances. What white has to do is create another weakness and try to win one more pawn, because having two pawns up that endgame, once you think of getting to that converted position, would actually be a win. So Grandmaster Danielian played the very strong h4, um, and the idea behind this is that after g6, she can play h5 and fix a weak pawn on h6. You might be wondering, well, did black actually have to play g6? If she wouldn't have played g6, her king would have been stuck between g8 and h7. Um, after ideas like rook c8, king h7, the rook can then go back on c7 and harass the f7 pawn instead, which is also annoying and there's not a lot of good ways to keep for black to keep defending it. Maybe she should have tried that instead, but that would have allowed white to come up with another winning plan. So g6, h5, black pushed g5 here. I think this was also a mistake because now the h6 pawn is extremely weak. She could have tried to continue instead with king g7. Again, the f7 pawn would have been the weakness instead. So she played g5 here. White continued with king g2. Um, white isn't in a rush to put pressure on h6. In the end game, it's also important to bring your king up, so she had time to play this. King g7, rook c6, putting the rook on the same rank as the uh, weak pawn on h6. Black played rook a2. She actually didn't have a lot of options here. There's not a lot of good moves. Um, knight h2 with the idea of coming to g4. Black played rook a4 to take away the square from the knight, and now the king g2 move became useful because she was able to play king f3, 
nicely coordinating all of her pieces together to support knight g4. Bishop a1, black is kind of just doing waiting moves here. Um, if anything, black is just defensive and reacting to white's moves here. Knight g4, putting pressure on h6, and there was no way for black to protect this pawn. Rook a2, knight takes h6, rook a5, g4, um, and in this position with two pawns up, white was able to win the endgame. I'll go a little bit further just to show you how that happened. Bishop b5, knight f5 check, king h7, rook c8, putting... Uh, sorry, for a second I thought she was putting pressure on the f7 pawn. That's not what happened, but rook c8 is taking away spaces from the king. Rook a7, rook e8, bishop f6, rook f8, rook d7, rook c8, rook a7, rook f8, rook d7. A lot of repetition here. I'm guessing they were in time pressure. Um, white was able to then trade off the f pawn, exchange it to where she had three pawns versus one. Like we mentioned earlier, having a two versus one pawn here in the endgame is actually winning. So all she needed to do was win that extra pawn and then trade off the rest. As we can see here, she was slowly, well, here she just gained another pawn. Had this not happened, Black's king was getting cornered. She may have even checkmated instead. But if the Black king wasn't here, say it was on the other side of the board, sorry, uh, say it was on the other side of the board, then the extra pawns would have been enough to get a win here. I hope you guys enjoy this and enjoy the Women's Speed Chess Championship. Let me know in the comments if you learned anything. And give it a, a thumbs up so that I can make more videos for the Chess.com channel. Thank you guys for watching.